Hello, and welcome to season two of Career Resilience, where we talk with people about their career path and their career journey, and maybe we can all learn from each other. My name is Jan Daniluk, and I'm a human resources consultant in London, Ontario, Canada. I work with Ford Keist LLP, providing human resources advice and counsel to my business clients. I also support people through individual one-on-one -on -one coaching in helping with career development. I hope you will enjoy our series where we talk with ordinary, extraordinary people. We get to hear about interesting journeys. We get to talk with people about failures, successes, advice, and counsel to us as we develop our own careers. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with these people, and I hope you will enjoy listening to us. And now for some logistics, please subscribe on YouTube, or if you're a listener, please follow me wherever you get your podcasts. And if you have a chance, I hope you'll visit my website, career-resilience.com. Welcome. My guest today is Chris Pulford. Chris, welcome to Career Resilience. Hey, thanks, Jan. Great to be here. Well, I really appreciate it. Now, our topic today is going to be throughout about resilience. And uh, of course, this is about career resilience overall, but we're going to be talking about the fact that um, you are dyslexic and sort of how that has affected your life. So I'm going to ask you some questions just to put you in context for, for what we're chatting about. So, so let's start with, with just getting a solid picture of, of Chris Pulford. So you're one of three boys? Yes, I am. The middle. <laughs> you're the middle boy. Okay. I'm one of three kids in, in, well, not kids, in my family. And the oldest was absolutely brilliant or is absolutely brilliant. The middle, incredibly charming. And the youngest being me, I was spoiled for about seven minutes. <laughs> not, not much longer than that, Chris. So for you, what was it like to be the middle kid? Uh, I think it was interesting. I think it's something that I've thought about a little bit more so recently and probably a little bit over the years. I think uh, being the middle is an, an interesting sort of balance. Obviously, you've got your older sibling that's kind of blazing the trail in some ways, although in my situation with my older brother, not always. And then sometimes that would fall to me. And then uh, with my younger brother, you know, he was sort of different entirely he was probably more the athlete in my family um so he was more gifted in that way um and my older brother was very intelligent and sort of pushed that way so i think when you're in the middle you're trying to figure out your own place sometimes yeah. just because you tend to have extremes on either side and then you're trying to balance the two personalities and that sort of thing so it's an interesting sort of role, I think. <laughs> I think you're right. And I often wondered with my brother who was the middle, if he wasn't incredibly charming because that was sort of a good thing to be. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so so let's talk about education now. What What is your education? Yeah, so I have a somewhat interesting education path, I'm sure. So I went to the University of Western Ontario in London, where I did my undergrad in psychology and criminology. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was an honors double major. And ultimately, while doing my undergrad, I sort of realized, well, I really enjoy these fields. I don't know if I had the conviction to sort of stay the whole path, go through to a PhD and get into uh, research and that sort of thing. So I ultimately left and went and worked for a little bit. And then I ended up going back to school to pursue my MBA at the University of Windsor. Okay, so you got your master's. And yeah. um, do you use that now, that knowledge <laughs> that you gained? Uh, I think I use the knowledge I gained probably from both pieces of education. Mm -hmm. uh, the MBA more that's probably why I have the role that I have now, um, which is at TD Bank. Um, so I lean pretty heavily on that. A lot of the financial stuff I learned, um, but a little bit of everything. And then I, I do fall back on that undergrad pretty frequently too. Um, just sort of the mindset that you, you get coming through that and then sort of a people focus on things. Yeah, hopefully more the psychology side than the criminal <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, so when you were growing up, Chris, what did you always want to be? Like, what, what did you say when I grow up, I want to be? I think when I was really little, I wanted to be a marine biologist. I think uh, I really loved animals. And I think back then, which isn't really all that long ago, but oh. the Discovery Channel was, you know, mostly animal and some nature shows. So I would just sit in front of the TV and watch those all the time. And I just like to learn about those things. Uh, and for some reason, that information just stuck in my head. So I always thought that that was going to be maybe the the route for me. And then um, when I did my undergrad in psychology, I did a lot of, you know, there's a lot of human behavior, but I did a lot of animal behavior stuff too, okay. um, which was available at Western. So I sort of thought maybe that connection. Um, but ultimately, <laughs> I ended up in in business because I think there's more probably roles available in that. And then as we sort of touched on a little bit before, I sort of realized that some things are better as hobbies than they are necessarily as careers, so. Um, you live in downtown Toronto? Yep. And, and yep. how's that for you? Uh, I love it. I, I kind of love being in a big city where there's lots of things happening and being able to go to different restaurants and have different events going on all the time. And you sort of, work and live in the same area. Uh, I find that very exciting. I like to have a lot of a lot of things going on around me. That seems to be what excites me. I find that calming in a weird way. Hmm. Well, there's a buzz in Toronto, isn't there? Yeah, certainly. And yeah. Uh, with COVID, it's maybe slowed down a little bit, but not much. <laughs> no, not much. I think that's, it, yeah, there's something about Toronto that's, it just sort of gets you going. So Okay, so I think we've got that picture, I, except for hobbies. What do you like to do in your spare time? That's a fair, fair question. So I have a few, lots of things that I'm not very good at. So I think when I was a kid, we started off as a ski family. So I started off skiing at, I think, the age of two and then eventually switched over to snowboarding. Um, so I've done that for a long time. So you tend to do that throughout the winters. Um, so recently I've picked up, uh, fishing, which my little brother and I kind of do. I'm awful at it, but it's, uh, it's nice to actually get outside and sort of do, uh, an activity like that. And then, um, throughout my life for more of my adult years, I've always done something like boxing or kickboxing and more recently jujitsu just to stay active. I find being in a class is better for me than yeah. trying to go to the gym, uh, and do it on my own. So, yeah. Well, those are great things. Sounds like the fish see you coming, though. <laughs> uh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> I am very bad. They are very safe. Um, so we talked before. Um, I, I wanted to chat about uh, diversity and, in your case, neurodiversity. We, we hear all the time about diversity. We know the importance of having the different viewpoints and different angles at which people come to things. And that helps us all be more creative but we don't talk so much about neurodiversity. And in your case, you're dyslexic. And that's what uh, we wanted to chat a little bit about. So, so when, when did you have an awareness that you were dyslexic? Yeah, there's probably two parts to that answer. I think uh, the very first time I was aware that something was maybe a little bit different uh, it was maybe a tiny bit after my parents knew, but I remember it's probably in kindergarten. I remember sort of arriving on that first day uh, and realizing that a lot of the other kids could read already and I had no ability to do so. And so at that point I was sort of instantly aware that I was maybe a little bit behind um, in that regard. And then as I progressed through school, I eventually got diagnosed uh, with a reading disability, which was pretty early on. I'm going to say, you know, maybe first or second grade where that first happened. Um, and, and that was just sort of a default blanket statement. They didn't really say dyslexia. They just said he's, you know, fairly behind on reading. So um, that's kind of that. And then it wasn't until really until I was probably 17 or 18 that I went through all the testing. And then that's when <laughs> dyslexia came out as uh, sort of the disability that was there, or I shouldn't say disability because I don't really frame it that way in my head, but um, 
yeah, that's sort of the way that's when that came out. And so uh, that was nice to kind of learn and sort of actually know what it is rather than this default sort of blanket. He's not very good at reading. So through all those, you know, formative years, how did that feel for you? Uh, not great at all times, <laughs> if I'm honest. Um, I, when I was probably in grade four, I got sent to a different school where they had uh, a program for kids that were behind on reading in order to, to catch up. So probably around that age, you feel a certain way about those types of experiences. You sort of wonder what's what's wrong with you? Why are you behind? Um, and then probably up through high school. Uh, at that point, I didn't myself feel too far behind, but you do get treated differently. Um, for me, I was on an IEP, so an individual education plan. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found in high school, sometimes that was not so good, just because teachers would know that you were on an IEP. And so instantly that would sort of separate you out sometimes um so you got kind of used to sometimes having a little bit of a barrier there when you were trying to do things when did you feel that you caught up in terms of reading seems to be the big example here uh that's a fair question i feel like by the time i hit high school i was maybe not completely at par, but it was close enough that it wasn't really a problem. Mm -hmm. And then probably by the time I hit university, I don't think there was really any issue anymore other than, you know, when you're reading tons and tons of chapters and textbooks and stuff like that, that would take me a little bit longer. Uh, I think probably the comprehension, at least for me, was there. It was just the amount of time that it would take. Um, so I probably had to be a little bit more tactical sometimes with what I read, realizing that I wasn't going to actually read at all. Uh, and I think there was at one point in university where I took a, an English class that was all on literature and we were supposed to read a novel probably every week. And I very quickly realized that was not the course for me. <laughs> There's no way I was getting through all those books. But um, other than that, I think I pretty well caught up. And by the time now when I sort of reached the workforce, I think I was pretty aware that at the very least, nobody else was going to notice um, that I had any issues with spelling, especially with spell check and that type of thing, or with reading. So mm -hmm. at that point, I sort of felt fully caught up, or at least at the level that I needed to be. So did you get, um, other than in school, from what you're describing, did you were there other things that you did, Chris, to sort of, I don't know, cope or catch yourself up? <laughs> Uh, I think my parents got me tutors and that type of thing outside of school um, in order to try to help me out. And then obviously I would read uh, in order to try to get there, although it, it probably in bursts, there are bursts of time where I try to read a lot just to get caught up on that. And then there were other times where I had no, interesting, no interest in reading because it sort of felt like a deficiency. I think generally, especially when you're kids, you don't really want to focus on that stuff. Yeah. Um, but I, I think some of it just comes about naturally. It just takes a little bit of time um, to sort of develop your coping mechanisms or your skills with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was definitely part of it. But yeah, there were definitely some outside things that, that I did in order to try to catch up on that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, did you disclose all the way along to friends and girlfriends and stuff? <laughs> uh, I think so. I, I didn't really have much of a choice. I think when I went off to a different school in grade four, I think everybody was pretty aware. And then having an IEP, at least teachers were uh, fairly aware and not always the best at keeping something like that a secret. So I think it was kind of out there. Um, so it never really bothered me in that way. I think it was always just sort of known. So the concept of keeping it a secret or not disclosing it, I never even really considered yeah. that. Um, maybe now sometimes, uh, I do, which is kind of interesting, um, is now when you apply for jobs and stuff like that, there's often questions on, you know, are you a person with, uh, invisible disability and stuff like that? And I sometimes 
don't put that I do just because I don't necessarily think that it qualifies. Um, and I don't necessarily say it in work environments all the time just because I don't, um, I worry about how people re perceive it more than I worry about actually having it, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. How, well, how, how do you think people perceive it? Uh, I think, you know, dyslexia, I mean, you get a fair amount of questions on it. I think a lot of people think it's just you look at a page and all, all the letters jumble up for you, um, which isn't really the case for me. I There's no experience of them jumbling. It's just that I do jumble them. So if I write out a word, I might write things in the wrong order uh, or the letters in the wrong order. But it never really occurs to me that that's, <laughs> that's what's happened. Mm -hmm. um, but you do get some questions on it. Uh, on sort of what that experience is like. And then the other thing is, I just don't know. I don't know how people always perceive it. And so some people, I think it's either uh, a non-issue and so there's no real benefit in them knowing. And then other people, I think it could be seen uh, as a negative maybe. Um, so I don't know, just always in my career, I've been less willing to arm people with that information. And I, I don't know why that is necessarily. I've sort of given an example, but it's weird to me that when I was younger, I never really worried about it. And then now it's something that I consider who I tell and who I share that with. Yeah. And yet here we are. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Here we are <laughs> disclosing it to everybody. <laughs> um, what do you think, Chris, was the effect on your, your parents? Uh, that's a good, good question. I think they probably worried about it a little bit when I was younger, I'm sure. And especially when they didn't know exactly what it was. I think, you know, I'm sure as any parent, it's like, what, where did we go wrong? And then it's like, how do we get him caught up? Uh, and all those sorts of things. But when I look back, especially on high school, I think I was very lucky to have the parents that I did have because I think they were probably my greatest advocates. Um, and because I just sort of had that blanket diagnosis of reading disability and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. I can remember a few different experiences with either teachers or guidance counselors um, where they didn't necessarily want me in a course or in their class. Like I can, like my first day of grade nine, I remember going into academic English and the teacher taking me aside and being like, I don't think academic English is for somebody with a uh, reading disability. And it was really my parents that advocated for me who were, you know, pretty much throughout my career, there was no way I was ever getting removed from those classes as long as I wanted to be there. Um, so I was lucky in that regard. I think they saw the skills that I had outside of maybe reading and that, those sort of things. And then they, they really focused in on that. So I, I'm sure they went through some things, but I, I feel pretty fortunate to have had the parents that I had throughout that experience. Yeah. Now, were you really good on the math science side? Uh, I was, especially when I was younger, like w in grade school, the math side was really natural for me. Uh, and, it, and I didn't really stick with it so much. So it probably went away. But I think as much as I couldn't read <laughs> very well at a young age, um, I know that I would help my older brother with math things sometimes, or my parents, when they were trying to quiz them on like multiplication tables and stuff like that, had to get me to go away because otherwise I'd be trying to say the answers before him and that type of thing. <laughs> so <laughs> the math, the math came naturally, but then I sort of neglected the math uh, probably in high school um, just because it didn't interest me as much. So it maybe wasn't, it was maybe a forgotten skill then. And then oddly enough, going back and doing the uh, MBA and that type of stuff. And then being where I am with the bank, I do a lot of stuff with financials. Uh, so you sort of lean back on all those principles again. Yeah. Who were your big influencers when you were growing up? Uh, I probably, uh, there's probably a few. I, I would think my grandfather on my dad's side was a huge influence in my life. Um, he was just kind of always there and he was a very happy, optimistic person and everybody seemed to respond to him in a very positive way. Uh, and he could be a little self-deprecating or at least 
self-actualized. Like he seemed to know kind of what he was. Uh, but at the same time, he was totally happy with it and going through his life in that way. And just sort of getting to see how everybody, A, responded to that in a positive way, and then B, be around that. I think he was a very good influence in that sort of way. That's neat. Anybody else who comes to mind? I mean, I think probably I should say my parents, because I'm sure they were more of an influence on my life than I, yeah. I realize. Um, and I think sometimes as a, a kid or as a person, we're kind of blind to how much of an impact that they do have on our lives because they're just always there. Um, but I'm sure a lot of what I am <laughs> is because of them. And more and more, I see parts of them sometimes in things that I do. So yeah. I'm sure those are big influences on my life as well. Yeah. Um, are you just sort of like um, amazed or just so proud of the fact that you, you've got a master's? <laughs> That's pretty <laughs> darn impressive, Chris. <laughs> I didn't think I was, I, there were certainly points in my life where I didn't think I was gonna end up with a master's degree. <laughs> Quite a few actually. I think, uh, I think, again, when I look back on it, there were times where, you know, the, I'm not totally sure that everybody's convinced I'd get through high school. So to end up with a master's degree is maybe a little bit beyond what I expected. Um, but I, I think there's just something to be said for just sticking with it. It's kind of, you, you've only really failed once you've stopped. As long as you keep going, it, it might take you a little longer, which it did for me at certain points. But uh, if you get to the finish line you wanted, that's all totally fine. How do you think being dyslexic has helped you in life? Uh, really good question. I think, I mean, there's probably the things that are unseen to me because, mm. I, I mean, you're just wired slightly differently. And if you've been wired slightly differently your entire life, I don't know that you necessarily see, see it or see where the situations are where you think about things differently. Um, so that part's probably harder for me to comment on, but I do think you sometimes bring a novel point of view to mm -hmm. the table um, when you have dyslexia. And then I think the other thing is you just sort of do at least barriers or challenges when you're young. Um, you know, you've kind of got this thing that you have to overcome built in and you just get used to doing that. And then when, when you encounter other things that you have to work your way through, um, you, you're more used to it. And with dyslexia, it's not necessarily just put in the hours. You sort of have to find coping mechanisms and stuff like that. And so you, you get used to the fact that, you know, if you can't go, go through it, go over it or go around it or whatever it is, but it, you just find a way to get there. So I think that's, that's kind of the thing that I probably lean on the most. And I definitely didn't realize it when I was younger and going through it, that that's maybe what I was developing. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think now that's maybe, you know, not that I've been some sort of super success in my life by any means, but I just, I think that that's kind of it. You get used to just because it sounds difficult or just because, uh, you know, maybe not everybody believes it's, it's possible doesn't mean that you can't do it. So that's probably the thing that I've taken away the most from it. Yeah, I think that sometimes it's almost a detriment when things come easy to people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's probably why I gave up on math. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's an interesting insight. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I must admit, I, 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 um, you know, it's not that long since you were in school. So it really quite mm. amazes me when you said that a teacher took you aside and said, you know, I don't think this is for you. And I, I wonder, was that trying to be kind? Was that it just not just sure what I, what I glean from that? What did you glean from that? Uh, I, it, I don't think it was kind I, when I, <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting one to think back on, uh, because it's, again, it's one of those moments that you don't really realize impacted you. And then, you know, it's all these years later and you still kind of think on it sometimes and, and you realize that it probably did. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't think it was kind it was kind of done a little bit publicly, um so i think it was oh. i don't know that it was necessarily a favor to me <laughs> okay. um <laughs> no that but sound good i 
I ended up staying in the class, so I got yeah. through it. So I think we're okay. Yeah, to my to to the point that you made and I made in terms of it, it it makes you stronger when things are a little less smooth. It it just does. I mean, life is never smooth, but but sometimes no. sometimes we're gifted with things that make us have to cope and make us stronger. I think so. Um, so I wanted to ask you. Um, when you think about role models and so on, is do you know anyone who's dyslexic that you've ever chatted things over with? Or <laughs> it's kind of incredible that you asked that, and I suddenly realized that I never really have, <laughs> and that it would make a ton of sense to do that at some point. <laughs> but I don't. I can't say it's something that I've ever ever done. And yet it seems so logical to do so. Uh, <laughs> I might have to make a note of that and actually take some time out at some point and go do that because <laughs> I think it'd be a good thing to do. Well, again, right? Um, you were traveling your own path and you were determined to travel that path. So maybe that's a part of being strong and so on. And I don't know, did, did you ever feel any shame about being dyslexic really uh yeah probably at certain points like i think it came and came and went uh at different points in my life i think certainly early on uh especially when i was young and i sort of felt behind i yeah i didn't feel great about it when you'd go around the classroom and everybody'd have to read a section of something i would be the kid who's trying to figure out which section is going to be mine and figure out what the words were ahead of time um so there was shame around it in that way um but i don't know i don't know quite how to frame it this is, might come off a little bit weird but i don't think there's ever shame about being dyslexic i think there was shame about being poor at reading uh, which is obviously a symptom of dyslexia, but I think that was the only really part that I felt bad about. Being dyslexic in and of itself wasn't really a negative to me. Well, and I'm sure it was almost, um, I think, as you said, a relief when you found out, okay, this is, there's a name to, for this thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> felt better. You can read up on it. You can learn a yeah. little bit more. <laughs> it's, yeah, exactly. Uh, what is your accomplishment that you're the most proud of? Uh, probably, I mean, I feel like I should say my master's probably, but I actually think it was my undergrad um, because that was probably more of an inflection point for me uh, where I just think, you know, I was still developing my coping mechanisms and still try to get through some things, I, I definitely had some courses that I did not pass in my undergrad, um, or had to drop out of. Uh, sometimes just biting off more than than I could chew. Um, but I think it was really that was really the point where I sort of figured out how to dig my heels in and really push through these things and really lean on some coping mechanisms, figure out my own things. High school, it always you know it was a little challenging, but you can get through high school, uh, but an undergrad is a little bit more of a challenge. So mm. that was probably the one for me that was the big inflection point. And so I think that's probably what I'm most proud of. Oh, good for you. Um, I also wanted to ask you, if you were talking with someone who was dyslexic and they asked you for advice, what would be the advice you would give someone? Yeah, it's, uh, it's sort of a just, stick with it, uh, if anything. Like, I think it's it's going to be a challenge, but as I alluded to earlier or said maybe even directly, it's, it's not really a failure until you stop necessarily. Like, you can take more time. Uh, you can develop different skills. You can do it a different way, and that's totally okay as long as you're still getting to the point that you want to get to. Um, so I think that's probably the message that I would give if, if somebody was going through it and trying to figure out their own mechanisms or way of dealing with it. Yeah. Are you an inherently positive person, Chris? I, I hope so. I think so. Yeah. Uh, thinking that yeah. related to what you said about your, your grandfather. 
yeah, I, I tend to try to be positive throughout everything and just sort of yeah. enjoy what's happening around me and not take anything too, too seriously. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Um, so I, I mentioned to you that um, this season on, on career resilience, I'm asking people three questions that I'm going to sort of spin into my blog. Um, so my, my three questions are, first of all, what is the best career advice that you have received? Yeah, I thought about this one a little bit, and it's maybe not the most direct advice, but uh, when I was first starting out my career, I spent a lot of times uh, on the telephone working with different clients when I was working at uh, Infotech in London. Mm -hmm. And I remember one time, I don't even remember who the person was or anything like that, but they just said to me, business is pretty simple until you add all the people. And it sort of <laughs> stuck with me <laughs> because it, it kind of is. It's the, if you really have to figure out what you need to focus on, at least for me, what I've decided to focus on throughout my career and trying to solve business problems is it's usually people-based. It's pretty easy to figure out, you know, uh, the math behind a product or, you know, how do I make, uh, make sure that I sell it for more than I produce it for. That's easy. Uh, but getting everybody on board with ideas is much, much harder. So that's sort of something that I've taken away and really tried to apply. So it's business is easy until you add the people. Yep. <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and I'm in human resources. So. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Might speak to you a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. My second question is, uh, is there a book that you've read or an, uh, something that you've seen someone that influenced you? Yeah. So there's probably... The first one's maybe the right answer to this question. And then the second one is probably the answer that first popped into my head when I, I heard this question. So the the right answer is probably I've always enjoyed Malcolm Gladwell and I've always Outliers was probably one of my favorite books uh, that I read through. And I sort of just like um, reading through his stuff or even listening to him just because it's a lot of sort of thought work, uh, which I really enjoyed throughout my time and then the second answer the one that first popped into my mind which is maybe a little bit uh weird on a career talk but uh i've been reading a little bit more just thanks to covid a tiny bit my girlfriend's really got into it so i've picked it up but more in the fiction space i think there's a lot of value in that as well just because i think there's a lot of perspective taking that comes with reading a book and trying to think through yeah. different mindsets and the way that things work and sort of going back to my last answer about business is easy until you add all the people, I think there's some value in trying to take different perspectives and think about things in different ways. Okay, so are you reading a fiction book right now? I just finished The Great Gatsby, which is kind of funny because I probably should have read it in high school, but didn't. <laughs> so I decided it was sort of a gap. Did you enjoy <laughs> it? Uh, I did actually quite a bit. It was very good. It's very short, which made it easy, <laughs> but uh, but I did I did like it. I think you know there's a reason why some of these books are famous. So yeah, yeah, that's the truth. Now the the third question is: What advice would you give a younger, much younger Chris Pulford? Um, yeah, I think probably just enjoy the process. Um, because I do sometimes have a tendency even now, so it's probably good advice to me at this moment as well, to be looking three steps ahead before I even finish the one that I'm on. Um, and so I think there's, there's something to be said about just be in the moment, enjoy it. There's always going to be challenges and things that you have to work through. Mm -hmm. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not a good time or worthwhile. And it doesn't necessarily mean that there won't be challenges with the next step and all that stuff. So enjoy it while you're in it. Um, and it'll make it a lot better. Yeah, I like that too. Those are three great things you said there, including the great Gatsby. Was there anything that you would like to say or add or? I think that's kind of it. I'm, I'm sure I have the, uh, dubious honor of maybe being the least accomplished person that's been on the talk, but I'm happy to be here and get the opportunity to sort of speak to you about 
my journey throughout my career thus far and mm -hmm. uh, hopefully it continues. Yeah, I'm sure it will. Okay, thanks so much, Chris. So to our viewers and listeners, thank you for joining Chris and me for this insightful conversation. I don't think he realizes quite how accomplished he is because you know what? You're accomplished, Chris. You, you have done so well. So please uh, subscribe on YouTube or follow me wherever you get your podcasts. And feel free to visit my website, which is career-resilience.com. And until we meet again, thanks. Thank you.